Katie, are you a bourbon girl? You know, I am. Um, I remember this one time my husband and I, we went to a whiskey bourbon tasting, which is a terrible idea, by the way, especially if you're driving. And so um, we had gone back to my hometown where they used to have a really big liquor store. And so they, they did this like big, uh, probably like 30 vendors because there's so many different kinds of bourbon and whiskey and bourbon whiskey and you know we can get into the nuance and so there was like you get a little sips of everything but you have a little sips of everything enough so that it's like you've drank like four full you know tumblers and so we had to just like sort of stumble across the street to get some really really greasy Chinese food to sort of love it out yeah <laughs> what about you Carrie <laughs> <laughs> Only when in the company of another bourbon drinker. It's funny. So I to appreciate it, I have to be with somebody like Jason Falls, who's like a bourbon connoisseur and can teach me how to taste it and everything. Because otherwise, I'm like, Bleh. like, <laughs> what even You're like Michael Scott asking for some Splenda? Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you know what, Carrie? I think it's time to punch out. On today's episode of Punch Out with Katie and Carrie, we are talking with Jason Falls. Jason is a digital marketing keynote speaker influence marketing thought leadership and a digital strategist at Cornet. Uh, and he has a new book coming out, which he will plug at the end of the show because during the show, we do not talk <laughs> about work. We don't, but it's called Winfluence if you want to cheat and search while we're talking to him. <laughs> you know. So Jason, thank you for joining us. And I'm excited to talk to you about all of this stuff. Let's start with bourbon. Why is bourbon a hobby for you? <laughs> well, when you're from Kentucky, you're, you're kind of raised in the industry. You, uh, you don't have a choice. Yeah, yeah, you don't have a whole lot of choice. You have to know something about it. You have to be be able to talk about it because when you have family and friends coming in from out of town, it's one of the first things they ask. Can we go to a distillery? Where's good bourbon? <laughs> um, and so, but but I do they also, sound exactly like that when they ask? Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they do. Um, but uh, I also have the added advantage of of working in the marketing world in the bourbon industry, so I, I get a lot of inside scoop on it. So it's yeah, it's part part of my work, but I enjoy, like I have the whole current 1792 lineup of bourbon sitting over my shoulder there. I've got a Weller and Buffalo Trace and Eagle Rare back here on the shelf. So I, I enjoy, I'm a connoisseur. I enjoy, I enjoy the, the brown spirit. What do you break out for like the important visitors and what do you give the regular people? <laughs> you know, I, it's funny you should ask that. That's actually, that's, that's a legit question. If you're a bourbon connoisseur and you, and you love bourbon, you're going to have um, you're going to have what you would call, you know, sort of a, a, a sip and bourbon that you like to drink. Um, and mine varies because I go from like, you know, one brand to another because, you know, I can't, I'm not going to drink a whole bottle by myself uh, in one sitting, maybe two. Um, but, you know, I'll pour myself a cocktail in the evening and I'll sip on something and I'll sip on that bottle until it's gone and then I'll move to something else. So you typically have a favorite bourbon or a couple favorite bourbons that you sip on. Then you have a sharing bourbon. So something that you isn't necessarily your favorite. Um, and it's something you don't mind if your guests mix in with ginger ale or soda or cocktails. If you're a real bourbon nutter, um, which is what I call them, you don't like to mix bourbon. You like to taste it neat or with maybe a little bit of ice, a little splash of water to kind of release the flavors. Um, but mixing is not a, is not a thing, uh, especially with, you know, higher priced and, and harder to find bourbons, but you always kind of have a everyday common bourbon on hand to offer to guests, to mix in cocktails. If people want cocktails, that kind of thing. And then for the, um, you know, for the fellow bourbon nutters, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I know you've got some better stuff than this. That's what you, I was wondering. Yeah, <laughs> you, you keep a, you keep a good bottle, sometimes hidden, sometimes top shelf on display. And it's like, eh, we don't break that one open. Um, and for me, that'll vary. Uh, right now, probably the best bottle of bourbon I have in the house uh, is the 1792 Full Proof, which is right. So steal there. that one first, everybody. Yeah. So that one was the 2019 uh, Jim Murray Whiskey Bible Whiskey of the Year. Uh, and so uh, it's not uncommon. You can find it out there, uh, but it's certainly an, an, an elevated level of bourbon. And then depending upon how lucky I get in finding uh, different you know, expressions or brands out there in liquor stores, I might have, you know, something rare like a Weller uh, 12 year or something like that that I, I pull off for, for good folks. What's the signal? How do you know, like, you have to break out the good stuff? Do they just give you a look when you break out the regular stuff and you're like, oh. If I don't know them already, it's the questions they ask. 
Because if, if they ask the right questions about, well, you know, have you tried this brand? Do you, have you ever heard of this brand? I'm like, okay, they know they're bourbon, so they're going to appreciate something a little bit, you know, elevated than kind of the day-to-day stuff. So it's typically, you know, the questions they ask. Um, there's um, Obviously, I have a handful of friends who, you know, they know uh, when I get a new bottle and they'll magically show up at my house because <laughs> they, they know <laughs> so I got Harry, it. I think you and I are stuck with the wild turkey, probably. <laughs> Like the, the whatever the equivalent of like Natty Light or Boone's Apple Wine is, the no, wild well, I, I would even say Wild Turkey is better in bourbon than Natty Light is in beer. There, <laughs> I mean we, that that is a strong statement, sir. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, claim. Yeah. Wild Wild Turkey <laughs> is is definitely something that uh, most people would have as their. I don't care if you mix this bourbon; you can mm-hmm. put it in whatever you want. You can drink it however you want. It's not going to bother me. It's a it's pretty like common dirty. brand. It's easy to find, <laughs> etc. Early Times is another one that's like that. Jim Beam, I think, is another one that's like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get into the premium bourbons, where it's like you can mix Maker's Mark, and it makes a really good cocktail. But there are some people who are like, "Don't mix my Maker's. Maker's is my bourbon. Don't do that." So it just depends on your your tastes. Now, do you have people who come in and want to debate the nuance between whiskey and bourbon and whiskey bourbon? I don't have people who want to debate it, but they typically want to know the difference. They say, well, I don't understand. I don't understand the difference. So tell me what the difference is. And so I try to give them a little bit of a breakdown of, you know, because there's different kinds of whiskeys. Bourbon is whiskey. All bourbon is whiskey. Um, but in order to be called bourbon, there's some, actually some legal requirements in the United States to be called bourbon. But then there's Canadian whiskey and there's Irish whiskey and there's scotch and there's all sorts of different whiskeys out there. Um, so I typically am explaining the difference more than I am debating. Now, there, there's one exception. Uh, people from Tennessee, Carrie, uh, people from Tennessee uh, or who live in Tennessee tend to love to brag about Jack Daniels. And sometimes they even call it bourbon. Legally, technically, it is bourbon. The the way that you make bourbon is the process that they make Jack Daniels with. It is categorized as bourbon. But what? but Tennessee whiskey takes the bourbon and then filters it, mellows it, is what they call it. Filter it over charcoal coals, and and so I uh, typically, as a smart ass Kentuckian, say. Yeah, I don't like uh, to call Tennessee whiskey bourbon uh, because uh, if real bourbon doesn't need to be poured over rocks to taste better. Um, and so that's the smart ass way to respond to that. Legally, that's the it Jason is Jason Falls way to respond that's to that. That's the Jason Falls way to respond <laughs> yes. to that. Yes. Got it. <laughs> but, so but all bourbon would, is whiskey. Not all whiskey is bourbon. That's correct. And and bourbon real quickly, there's, there's lots of complex ex- explanations, but basically bourbon is, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, 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 whiskey that is, uh, aged in charred new white oak barrels. It has to be 51% corn mash. So it's a corn whiskey, majority corn in the mash bill aged in charred new white oak barrels. There is a, uh, maximum number of proof that it can be used to be put in the barrel. And there's a maximum that it can be uh, put in the bottle. Um, in them. in general, that's that's the rules for bourbon. You can get real specific. And do the bourbon police come for you? Like if you do it wrong? No, you just have the people who know the definition of bourbon. If you call something bourbon and it's not, they just give you a look and be like, oh, whatever, plebe. So. <laughs> now, what do you think about? So there's this. Uh, I don't know if it's new, but it's a little bit more trendy with. Uh, different kinds of alcohol, like red wine, for example. There's a lot of red wine that has been aged in a bourbon barrel. Mm-hmm. What do you, What do you think of that? Like, is that sort of sacrilege, or is that a good idea? No, it's a, so. So there's there's two ways to think about that. If you take another spirit and age it in a bourbon barrel, that's kind of a high compliment to bourbon. You're saying, hey, we think so highly of bourbon that we're going to finish our spirit in that. And did you know that lots of the um, higher end, better scotches in the world are actually aged in used bourbon barrels? Not because scotch doesn't have the requirement that it has to be a new barrel. So scotches a lot of times will be aged in some other spirit barrel. And a lot of good scotches are aged in bourbon barrels. Um, in fact, I think Lafroig, which is one of my favorite scotches, if I'm to dr- drink a scotch, I think is still aged in uh, Maker's Mark barrels. So there's, and they're owned by the same company. So that makes a lot of sense. I'm drinking coffee that was, that has like a whiskey flavor to it from our yep. Roasters because I interviewed Nate Woodruff yeah. for the backpack show and his, his whiskey with a view account on Instagram. All it is, is going around and like taking pictures of high-end whiskey bottles, like mm-hmm. on, on these scenic vistas and stuff. 
And uh, that's like, that's what he does. What he does yeah. for a living, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, so even coffee and it doesn't, people were like, oh my God, I can't drink that. It's going to be too strong. It, it just has this like smooth, robust flavor. It's not, it's not spicy exactly, but yeah. it has kind of a different, it, it definitely gives it like a different flavor. It's and got, a kick, it's got it. a kick to it. Sure. A and, little bit. Yeah. And, and so, so aging something else in a bourbon barrel is a high compliment to bourbon. Now there's a new sort of within the bourbon inter, uh, industry controversy right now about, okay, but the other way doesn't work for some people. Take a bourbon and finish it in somebody else's barrel. So mm -hmm. like, for instance, Angel's Envy uh, is bourbon that is finished in, I think, port barrels, uh, port wine barrels. Um, and now you've got a bunch of, of other um, uh, you know, bourbon brands out there that are saying, OK, we're going to have an expression that's aged in a port barrel or aged in, you know, uh, uh, some a sherry or brandy cask. Um, and so these basically, technically, some people in the industry say when you put the take the barrel, the bourbon out of the barrel and you put it in a different barrel, it no longer is bourbon. It does not meet the requirements of bourbon anymore. There are some people within the bourbon industry that say that's horse crap. You, basically, you're just taking bourbon and adding a little flavor to it, which in some cases is general is accepted. So there's this debate now of, as to whether a cask finish or a port finish bourbon is technically bourbon. I don't necessarily know that I have a position on that. If it's bourbon and you're just trying to make it, you know, give it a little finish to it. It, it doesn't bother me. I'm going to have to get back to you uh, with our official position. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> and if it tastes good, drink it. It doesn't matter what you call it. So when are you giving up marketing and opening a distillery? Oh, geez. You're I don't clearly know. knowledgeable. The well, I was going to say, if uh, I would have to win one hell of a lottery to be able to do that. Cause <laughs> a, it would cost a shit ton of money to do that. Uh, and, and, and B, I don't know that I necessarily have that kind of knowledge. I know enough to talk, you know, about bourbon from some position of knowledge and authority, but there are people even that I work with at the agency where I work who know 10 times more than I do. You'd be a great partner though, for a distillery because mm -hmm. you understand marketing premium spirits. Yeah, I, that, that might be a good role for me. And that, that's kind of part of the and role taster, that I have you know, whatever. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm, I'd be real good in the tasting room. Prop up the bar. You want to take pictures of bourbon bottles like at the top of really tall mountains with like waterfalls <laughs> in the background. Put it on Instagram. There you go. Add an inspirational quote. I think it could work. <laughs> it's worth a shot. You never know. <laughs> so speaking of taking pictures, I know that photography is another one of your hobbies. Yeah. You know, can that's what you've told us. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're right. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about this quasi hobby that you may or may not have? So it, this, this was one that stemmed out of having kids because my, my son played soccer, uh, until he was, you know, a freshman in high school and unfortunately didn't make the, the, the varsity team or the freshman team or whatever. Uh, and then my daughter, uh, that's her right there. That's Katie, uh, yeah. in a, in a perform. And I took that picture, uh, uh, in a performance for, uh, uh, Louisville's, um, uh, the Turner circus, which is a kind of a Cirque du Soleil type troupe. Uh, in in Louisville that she was in for quite some time. So my kids got active in these things and I wanted to take pictures of them just, you know, to be able to have things like that hanging on my wall. And so I got a you know nice camera. I had worked the uh, first 15 years of my professional career, I worked in, in sports PR. And so I had learned how to take some sports photography, amateur sports photography over the years. So I got a nice camera one year for Christmas and got some lenses and figured out how to take some good sports action shots. And then I figured out how to work with the lighting for a theatrical performance and take some of that. And so now I've got a nice camera and some equipment and whatnot. And so sometimes I'll go out and take pictures of my kids or take pictures of our, uh, my son's dog or, you know, bourbon bottles on other people's bars or, you know, whatever stuff that I like <laughs> to like, take oh, pictures get of. Get out of here. We talked to you about this last time. <laughs> I will, I will say this when I open up my phone, my, and my, and, and, and get, look at my pictures uh, for, it's been a while since my son's played in a soccer match. Uh, and my daughter actually played soccer one year too. I, there was a while there that I could not find a picture that wasn't a soccer action shot because I, mm. when you take sports action photography, in order to get 10 good pictures, you got to take about 40 shots, right? Or That's how I do sometimes. all my pictures. Honestly. Exactly. <laughs> really so I would take them and then bring them home and edit them. But when I, you know, plugged the card into the computer, it automatically put them on iPhoto. So there's millions of pictures up there that are probably crap. And then there's a handful that are okay. See, I don't, I definitely don't. Well, I'm not a great photographer to begin with, but I usually take one picture 
And then if it's good, if it's good, great. If it's not, whatever. <laughs> so there's actually, I don't remember what the commercial is, but there's this commercial where this like woman, oh, it's like a infomercial where it's like this purse where you like put your phone inside the purse, but you can still see it through the plastic. Yeah. And my husband keeps saying, he's like, why does her phone have just pictures of pizza on it? <laughs> and of course I was like, um, that's not weird. And I showed him my phone, <laughs> which has pictures of the pizzas that I made. Like I took a picture of the pizza last night. I was like, why is that weird? I really right. like pizza. It's a little weird. It's not weird, Carrie. A lot, of people take pic in life. a lot of people take pictures of their food. Hey, for Katie, it might be, Carrie, it might be that's her art. She she makes exactly. pizza art and then eats I it. I do. Don't Thank stand you, up Jason. for her. I do have this. I, I got a whole me. bunch of games the other day. I got a shipment from the guy who did Loaded Questions. And so I, I that's like my picture. I took a bunch nice. of pictures. You know how hard it is to like get the light just right on every game title so oh. it's not blurred out. Come on. That's tough. I forget motion capture is what I'm trying to tell you. Like I can't do anything sophisticated. I can't take pictures of boxes on a stool. So photography is never going to be like my hobby. Funny. See this. I just can't. I scrolled back just a little bit and there's like soccer, soccer, oh, yeah. soccer, soccer, soccer. It's definitely a lot harder than I think people anticipate, even with newer phones saying that they have these great lenses and all the filters. Like photography is still a really difficult skill set. Yeah, a and a lot and, of settings and stuff. Yeah, yeah. there is it, to, the, to get the lighting settings right for what you're trying to do is is probably the hardest thing. If you have the right lighting settings, you can take pictures that you weren't even you didn't even think you could possibly do. Um, I remember the first time that I got um, kind of the lighting settings right for one of my son's soccer matches. It turns out that. Uh, when you're taking outdoor photography for sports, there's camera speeds and shutter speeds and all that, that you got to kind of get right in order to stop the action well enough to see it. So there's, that's one hurdle, but then if there's sunshine versus overcast, or if there's clouds that make that variable during the mat, the game, Oh crap. It's, mm. it's, it's a nightmare. But I remember the first time that I ever took pictures where I had the lighting settings just right and it was overcast and consistent the whole game. I, I went from having 15 good pictures after the match to like 50. And I remember I started taking pictures of all the other kids. And then that kind of got me going on by the end of the year, I'm going to have a really good action shot of every kid on the team. And we're going to make trading cards for the team. And I'm going to give them to the other parents. And <laughs> I just kind of, I geeked out and went nuts with it, but I had a lot of fun with it. So, and they're like, once again, Mr. Falls, we're going to have to ask you to stop. <laughs> well, yeah, I got a little bit of that sometimes. Um, but, but one thing, one thing that's cool about it though, I was able to give them something that they generally appreciated and their kids appreciated. And, and that endeared me to, to people I normally completely turn off and, and are mad at me all the time because I'm obnoxious when I'm, when I'm not taking pictures. I what? Get it's charming. And, yeah. Well, they don't like me. I, I got in a really, uh, there was a, 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 an instance at a soccer match when I wasn't taking pictures, my son and I had gone to support his classmates in a different match. And the uh, official made this horrendous call that has never, it's been called like three times in the history of soccer around the world. And I saw that he made a horrendous call and I just started letting this guy have it from the bleachers. And I was screaming loud and all the parents were like, Oh, John, make him stop. You know I mean? It was, <laughs> it was bad. I almost got thrown. They're out. like, he doesn't even go here. <laughs> exactly. Shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Is that I another hobby be... of yours? Heckling? <laughs> well, you know, when you work in college exactly. athletics for 15 years and you're not allowed to cheer, you're not allowed to comment mm. on the game. So you bottle all that up. Well, now that I'm allowed to comment <laughs> on the game, I comment on the game. <laughs> so you must be really fun at viewing parties. Yeah. Yeah. I can. And, and I've, my voice carries too. I've got a nice big booming. Um, I, <laughs> I, I have to the remember to tone myself down a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we should make trading cards for the for some of the marketing events. So like all of like the marketing superstars like Kerry and Chris Penn, like you mm -hmm. should I want to see trading cards. I would not I'd be collect the those. top line for that. <laughs> like, I could know. I could probably pull that together just pulling pictures off of Flickr and, and Facebook and stuff. Right? We could we could I make think, that happen. I think I would be more interested to see what kind of stats you put on those cards. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. It's very competitive. So I think like one well-placed, really nice bottle of bourbon could get me some better stats. <laughs> could be. Could be. Like, how do you rank higher than Chris Penn for analytics? <laughs> <laughs> like bourbon. <laughs> I studied up. You know, we could Don't get a spot. We could get a sponsor and have one of the one of the influencer tools rank them all. And that's how we put the stats on the back. Um, yeah, except <laughs> maybe just one. One small adjustment for me. See, I but I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're worried about because we can we can ta tailor the the analytics to be. It can be a, a, a data set of, of five people. It doesn't have to be who's the most influential people in all of marketing. It's who's yeah. the most influential people in the eight we're looking at. Yes, now we're right. talking. See, I went to a high school that had like thirty five people in my class, so that's the kind of pool I need. To like there you go. Know. <laughs> I don't carry. You're not helping yourself here. My law school class was bigger. My law school class, like you just interviewed bigger. Sir Mix a lot. What are you talking about? You're more influential than any of us. So <laughs> I wasn't Sir Mix a lot. <laughs> I was well, there. That's true, but we're not trying to be Sir Mix a lot. But the no, fact that fair. we that you have some sort of connection to him now makes you even more cool. Yeah, my six that's degrees true. looks a lot better. I guess that's fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> what about documentary filmmaking? So we've talked about drinking, we've talked about photography, but documentaries. Another so hobby. my my hobby with documentaries is less about making them, although I've I've tried to to do that through both my podcasts and some other things that I do, um, and more about watching them. I just I that's my that's my jam, you know. Instead of watch them, instead of reading a book, I'm dialing up documentaries on Netflix or Amazon Prime, and I just eat them up. I love music documentaries because mm -hmm. I'm not a musician by any stretch of the imagination, but I've always had a great admiration for those who can create good music. And so I gobble up the bios of, of musicians and bands and things like that. Um, I just, I, it, for me, it like feeds my brain. It gives me that sort of pop culture, history, background knowledge that I can use in my writing and other things. So it's just kind of, you know, just feeding what I know. I also love trivia. And so documentaries feed that knowledge that I'm, I'm able to use when I you know feel like going out and playing trivia whenever I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that again, but um, I, I enjoy doing the trivia stuff. So, you miss yeah. VH1 behind the music? I, I was do. just going to ask that question. I Here's used to watch it. I had to watch it if it was on, <laughs> even if I had seen that episode like 16 you times. You have to watch it. You have to watch it again. I, I want that guy to narrate my life. Like that that voice in behind the music is so familiar and soothing and informative. Like I love that guy's voice. Who do yeah. you want to Can narrate you your life, Katie? Real quick though about it. Yeah. So I was a film student and uh, so we created a lot of really terrible movies. And one of the movies we created was a spoof on uh, behind the music. And so we used a lot of the same types of um, assets. And so the whole thing was based around uh, this kid who called himself DJ chicken wing and he was a terrible <laughs> DJ. And like, we got one of like my whitest of white friends to like pretend that he was trying to be an urban DJ. And it was just like, Behind the Music always has a special place in my heart because of that. Yep. But I am also obsessed with those music documentaries as well. And I guess my other question for you is, on Netflix, did you watch The Dirt, which is more of like a lifetime movie version yes. of a documentary? <laughs> I did. I did watch The Dirt. I, I think I finished Netflix, actually. Um, I think I've seen, <laughs> I've seen all of it. Everything. Yeah. I'm at, well, I'll take the end of the rabbit hole. I take that done. back. I think I've got one more season of Blacklist to get through, and then I'm mm. done. I'm oh, I, I pieced out a Blacklist. I don't know. I don't know. I, James Spader in that role just I, I like him. He's good. He's it's a good good show. It went all so X Files your... for me though, and stopped making sense. <laughs> so I just was like, nope. <laughs> What are some of your favorite music documentaries that you've seen? Like, what are some of the more, obviously there's some really interesting artists out there, yeah. but the documentary itself, depending on who's making it might not make the artist seem all of that interesting. Oh yeah. There's, there's a couple that have been uh, fantastic. Uh, well, I will say this I, it, a top of the list for me is, is beyond the lighted stage, which is the documentary of rush. Mm -hmm. And I'm a rush fan, have been a rush fan forever. Uh, but it's kind of seeing the behind the scenes and actually seeing like interview footage with Neil Peart, who is notoriously like hermit like and doesn't want to do publicity things. Uh, that was a real treat. And I've, I bet I've watched that probably a dozen times or, or more since it came out a few years ago. Um, but uh, I really love the ones where you discover new music or, or artists that you didn't know about. 
Uh, and sh and so uh, there's one called uh, Searching for Sugar Man, I think, um, which is about a, a guy in Detroit who was like a construction worker when they when they rediscovered him. He did like one or two albums back in the 60s or 70s. And just, you know, uh, word of mouth and or kind of almost a, an interesting, weird viral connection. Somebody who had the album from Detroit or wherever they bought it, got on a plane and went to visit their cousins in South Africa and took the record with them. And this guy's there. He had a song or two that became hits in South Africa. And he never knew that. And so like decades later, some former DJ or record store owner in South Africa goes searching for whoever this guy is and finds him in Detroit. And he's just a construction worker, you know, middle-class guy working a regular life. He's in his sixties or whatnot. And he convinces him to come back to South Africa and do a, a concert tour like 30 years after he had a hit record. And he does. And now, like once a year, he goes and does a bunch of shows in South Africa and is a rock star and then comes home and works construction or whatever he does now. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, wow. I mean, those those are the stories that I'm just like, who? What? Really? That happened and nobody <laughs> knows that yet? And so I, I go to iTunes and download the music and I, like I get really get into it. So I love discovering new music. So it's not so much that I go after, well, let's watch the documentary of how Kurt Cobain died, which I've watched and I'm interested in, but it's more like, I want to know something about artists that either I don't listen to, or I don't know anything about. And, and that helps me discover music that I haven't yet discovered. I like to watch them for ones that uh, for artists I do love. Like I watched the Nina Simone one. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. to me because I knew her music, but I didn't yep. know anything about her. So that yep. was really powerful. I also really like the Muscle Shoals documentary. If you watch, yes. if you haven't watched that one, the one about the studio music yeah. studio there, is so so cool. I mean, it spans like a lot of bands because a yeah. lot of music was recorded there. Oh yeah, it's the, the those guys were basically the backup band for every major hit in America for about. 15 years, right? Their list of work is like and, ridiculous. And they're like down home country, Alabama guys. You yeah. just happen to have a, a studio that has a magic sound. That's and, gotta be one of those things where like years later you turn around and go, Oh my yeah. God, <laughs> I'm yeah. really cool. I never knew. <laughs> yeah. What's that? I'm hoping about? for that day. <laughs> that day might be today. I don't know. You never know. I recently watched the, um, the queen, it's sort of a documentary. Uh, it was more so like the behind the scenes of how after Freddie Mercury passed away, they were able to sort of like continue. I think it's called the show must go on. Mm -hmm. um, and so where they partnered with Adam Lambert. And yeah. so I think that, you know, we could debate that nuance forever, but you know, I think that them putting Adam Lambert in the front was at the time a controversial mm -hmm. decision, but just seeing the evolution of how that came about mm -hmm. from a different perspective was really, really interesting. And the fact that even, queen is saying like we're not trying to replace freddie mercury like we just want a really good singer who can let us do our thing and the show go on well and and i watched that probably about a month ago and it was really the first time i had ever paid any attention to adam lambert i don't watch the reality shows yeah. or any of those things and i had heard of him i maybe had heard a song or two but i had no appreciation for his music uh, or or him as an artist. And after watching that, not only do I now have a great appreciation for his talent, but I'm also thinking, hey, you Queen fans need to lighten the hell up because if there's anybody who's the right person to replace Freddie, Freddie Mercury, it's him. Like he totally fits the mold and, and they sound great with him uh, uh, fronting that band. So, I mean, if you can't have Freddie, well, why not Adam Lambert? Holy moly. I think it's the same thing with happened with Journey. They tried to get a guy who sounded exactly, is that what you were just going to say, Carrie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't work because he felt artistically stifled because yeah. Journey only wanted to play Journey songs and none of his new original music. Whereas with Queen and Adam Lambert, he plays with Queen and then he goes off and does his own thing. And it yeah. that seems to make a lot more sense for that kind of artist. Yeah. I was speaking of behind the music. One more thing before we go on to something else. Uh, I was always, I was waiting for, and I was so angry when behind the music went off the air because they never did one on Toto and I wanted them to do <laughs> one on Toto. That was the band I was waiting to hear because, uh, uh, the, the, the drummer, uh, from, uh, Pecoro, Jeff Pecoro from, from Toto died. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was controversy around his death. The, the mm -hmm. coroner, I think ruled that it was drug overdose, but his you know, family was like, he didn't do drugs and they blamed it on some sort of like, 
uh, a pest repellent thing or weed repellent thing that was sprayed on his lawn and he had an re allergic reaction to it. And I know there was controversy there. And I was like, that's a behind the music episode waiting to happen. And they never, they never played it. You'll just have to so, bring it back, get the right. I think you need to make it. Bring it back. I, I think it would be interesting. I will say though, I, the, the one that pissed me off was, uh, um, uh, uh, sticks, uh, because it just reminded me that Dennis DeYoung <laughs> ruined one of the best rock bands ever. Like it's just, just terrible. <laughs> There's always someone that ruins the rock band. They break up at some point and it's like someone's mm -hmm. fault and then everyone hates them. And that's just yeah. how it is, you know? And then they end up on behind the music. They end up on yeah. behind the music, which is the very best part. <laughs> I actually saw Tommy Shaw in the Dallas airport one time. And we like, our, we met, I was coming down an escalator and he was standing at the gate at the bottom of it. And like, we locked eyes and he knew, that guy recognizes me and he immediately turned and walked away. And I'm like, I'm not going to bother you. <laughs> like, that happened to you a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that to you next I, time I, I see you. I definitely you know, have people re react to me like I am a, 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 a pandemic sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, Jason, if people want to find out more about you online professionally, where's the best place for them to find you? Uh, two places, probably. Team Cornet is uh, the agency where I work. Cornet, we do really good creative work. And then uh, JasonFalls.com is the best place to find stuff, uh, in, including um, you know my, my podcasts that you can listen to. One's about marketing overall. One's about uh, influencer marketing. Uh, and then you can also find links to my influencer marketing page where you can learn more about the book, which is coming up. Pre-sales aren't available yet, uh, but as soon as they are, it'll be on JasonFalls.com. So you should go there. Yeah, you have many, many podcasts. Actually, do you want to list them? Or I just, I just, I really just have the two. Although we are, we we have another one in development right now. So Cornette has Digging Deeper, which is where I interview somebody from the marketing world about some creativity or marketing topic each week. Uh, that's actually a live stream on Tuesday mornings across the social networks. And then uh, Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast, is the companion to my new book, which is coming out in early 2021. And that typically releases new episodes on Wednesday mornings. So there will be a new one coming out tomorrow morning. Um, and then we've got another one in the works that I can't talk about yet because we haven't mm -hmm. decided on the name and all that stuff. But of course, we're, now it's all I want to know about. Yeah, well, that, that <laughs> one's, that one's going to be very niche, but it's going to be really interesting. I'm not hosting it. I'm just producing it. And so it's going to be it's going to be another fun foray into what Cornette's doing in terms of, of producing some content. That sounds like fun. We're in. Yeah. We're all the way in. Is it about bourbon, like bottle caps or something? It, it's, it's, it's definitely it's going to have it. something to do with drinking. Ooh, well, thanks That's for talking cool. with us today. This was fun. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. This was cool. I mean, you're always fun. It's not like I expected it not to be fun. Eh, yeah, I can be. <laughs> Every now and then. <laughs>